are these people? Speaking of listening to others, leads us to our next story, Colin. You ready? Yeah, so this is one of the rare times that Twitter actually works. <laughs> what I mean by that. So, you know, I found this story on Twitter, uh, I think over the weekend. And um, and those of you who know me well, you know that I've lived in Africa for a bit and I visit, I try and visit every every year uh, in East Africa. Um, I love the region, I love the people. And part of why I have my personal channel is to highlight, you know, issues that are based in Africa, because often, especially in the world space, are often ignored. Um, so, um, but this was from Popular Resistance slash uh, Back Agenda Report. So this was an interview with Dr. Fred Lamembe, who is president of the Socialist Party of Zambia. So he was recently a guest, and he did this interview with Sean Blackman and Jacqueline Lukeman um, regarding Ukraine. And I thought it was very interesting in what he was saying, because obviously, you know, Africa, as many probably know, Africa has a slightly different take on Ukraine versus what the West is telling us of how we should feel about Ukraine and Russia in general. So, um, so I'm actually going to read this interview. Um, and then, yeah. There you uh, go. Here we go. One more. All right. Perfect. So I may not read all of it, but at least enough of it that we get at least the idea of what Dr. Mamembe uh, was saying in Let's this. see if I can this. zoom close enough, maybe. Yeah, if you can zoom out a bit. I can read if you can zoom out a little bit more. more. Yeah. There, there we go. go. I can read that, actually. That's fine. Okay. Um, okay. Um, and doctor, of course, we've been following on the show very closely the ra rapidly ex escalating war in Ukraine, this proxy war between us and NATO forces and Russia. And we've been keeping a close eye on the international response to this war, as you know, the US and the West, its allies and junior partners, you know, to try to present this image as if, you know, the whole international community is sort of siding with them in condemnation of Russia's invasion of Ukraine in February of this year. But I feel like once you take a closer look at how some of these opinions and perspectives from different governments are really playing out, I think the picture is a bit more complicated. Now, back in March, the, in the United Nations, there was a debate over a resolution fundamentally to condemn Moscow for its invasion of Ukraine. And within that vote, 35 countries abstained from it, including 17 member states of the African Union. And there have been also, also been leaders like Cyril Ramposha from South Africa that have not necessarily jumped on the Western bandwagon with this as well. And so we wanted to bring you in, we want to bring you to sort to discuss this because from your perspective, obviously, you are in Zambia, a country in Southern Africa. And I'm just wondering why you think we've seen these kinds of responses from some of these different African governments towards the war in Ukraine. And what do you think it says about the reality of geopolitics right now? So here's his response. First, let me say it is very important to understand that no war is good. It is impossible not to be moved by the outrageousness of warfare. They grow some fears of civilians who are trapped between choices that are not their own, but was made very complicated historical processes that appear to be simple. The war in Ukraine is not merely about NATO or about ethnicity. It is about many things. Every war must end at some point, and the diplomas must restart the must come in. Africa and the Russian people share a history of struggle. When the African people were fighting for their independence, for their liberation, those who are condemning Russia today, we are not with them then. They were on the other side. They never took our side. Not that our side was wrong. Our side was right. But they never took our side. They took the side of the colonialists. They took the side of the side of apartheid. They took the side of racist super superiority against the forces of liberation, African liberation. We'll never forget that. They want us to forget that, but it's not easy to forget that because it's not very long ago, Zimbabwe only became independent in 1980. Nambia only became independent in 1990. This was not very long ago in terms of historical processes. We, knew, we know who stood with the apartheid regime in South Africa. We know who stood with the racist regime in Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe. We know who sided with the colonists in Angola, 
in Mozambique, in the Cape Verde. We know all these things. So the African people have a sense of history as well. It's not possible for Africans to condemn Russia, given where we're coming from together. And the Russian war is a complicated process. And let's not be simplistic about it. Let's understand where this process is coming from. Since 1990, there's been an attempt to expand the NATO forces in Eastern Europe up to Russia. There was some cooperation initially, even from Russia itself under Boris Yeltsin. There was some engagement, but all that has changed. And it's important to understand that long history and the Africans understand that. We are able to analyze things for ourselves. We're able to see things for ourselves. We're able to come to our own conclusions. And we also, we understand the decisions and actions of our enemies and also decisions and actions of our friends. We're even able to understand the mistakes of our friends and to separate them or single them out to identify them from the actions and decisions of our enemies. We know who our friends are. The Russian people have stood on our side. Russia has never had colonies in Africa. That must be understood. Despite helping to liberate us, Russia has never taken control of any African country. Russia has never colonized any country that they helped to liberate. Russia has not exploited an African country. We do not know of any country in Africa that can claim it was a colony of Russia, claim that it has been exploited and humiliated by Russia. This history is very clear to us. And, it's not, and this is not easy for us to be swayed by propaganda against Russia. So actually there's some parts there that I actually do wanna go back to, but for time, I will read it through and then um, I'll share my thoughts after that. We don't want the war in Ukraine to continue as Africans. War is bad. War is not good for the poor. War is not good for the workers. War is in itself a crime. War produces crimes. Peace must always be a priority. We Africans want the war in Ukraine to end, but that won't end without taking into account the security concerns of Russia and indeed the security concerns of Ukraine itself, and even the secure security concerns of Europe itself. It shouldn't be the security of one section or one region or one country. The security of all must be considered. The security of Ukraine must be considered. The security of Russia must be considered. And indeed, the security of Europe. Emphasizing on just one side of the equation, it won't work. You cannot have security for Europe. You cannot have security for Ukraine without taking into account the security concerns of Russia. Similarly, you cannot have the security concerns of Russia addressed without taking into account the security concerns of Ukraine, the security concerns of Europe. We all need security. As we pursue our own secure interests, security interests, we must also take into account the security concerns of others. This is what is lacking in the issue of Ukraine. Russia has legitimate security concerns, and they didn't just walk into Ukraine. From 2004, they have been actively pursuing these issues. But instead of addressing them, the opposite has happened. NATO has been expanding its lines. NATO has been trying to consolidate its positions in Eastern Europe up to the Russian border. What did you expect Russia to do, sit idle and watch? Is security concerns are not being addressed? Is security being violated? Is security being threatened? Would the US or Europe accept that situation? Who in the world would accept that to happen? So that Jacqueline, uh, comments. You know, what you just said, that brief encapsulation of the history of solidarity, really, that the Russian people and that the Russian government has had with the African liberation struggles over decades is so important. I think to this conversation, because I think in some ways, we in the United States, even though we who are, are pan-Africanists, understand and know a bit of that history. Most people do not, do not, so most people don't understand and don't know. They're ignorant of the struggle against colonialism colonialism on the African continent. So they're ignorant of the abuses and they're ignorant of their relationship with Russia and the continent. And in that context, do you think that it's just the ignorance of this relationship that you just explained that makes it difficult for us in the United States to understand why African nations are refusing to condemn Russia and also why we have difficult time pulling back from literally cheering this war to continue in order to quote unquote support Ukraine as our government tells us without any consideration for the lives of the people who are caught in the middle of this war, as you said, who did not choose it and who did not ask for it, most of whom are working class and poor people on the continent of Africa. Um, so Dr. Mbembe continues. 
Sometimes it's not the issue of ignorance. Sometimes it's the issue of arrogance and the problem sometimes even racist attitudes. What's good for the goose is good for the gander. What's good for America is also good for others. America would not tolerate what it wants Russia to tolerate on its borders. If Russia was to move into Mexico today or into Canada, and they do what the Americans and the Europeans are trying to do in Ukraine, I don't think they will tolerate that. We have the 1962 Cuban Missile Crisis. Cuba is 90 miles away from Florida. But when the Soviet Union places missiles there, there was a big crisis, which had to be resolved amicably. Why should Russia feel secure? With Ukraine becoming a NATO member and placing missiles on its border. There are issues that need to be guaranteed. What we need is adherence to the Minsk agreements. What is, uh, can you, yes. oh, what is needed is security guarantees for Russia and Ukraine, which would also require Europe to develop an independent relationship with Russia that's not shaped by US interests. There will also have to be a reversal of U Ukraine's ultra nationalist laws, and they return it to a much more dual national, national compact. If in some sense negotiations and agreements regarding these essential matters do not materialize, it is likely that the dangerous weapons will face each other across the divides, and additional countries may be drawn into this conflict with a potential to spiral out of control. We do not want this conflict to get out of control. There is a need for negotiations to end this war, and the negotiations in our view center around these three principal issues. They're returning to the mixed agreements, security guarantees for Russia and Ukraine, reversal of ultra traditionist laws. This is not demanding too much. Of course, these are not simple issues, but there are issues that need to be addressed. Um, mm -hmm. For sure. And you know, last question, Dr. Mbembe is, you know, we're in a time from the standpoint of a US imperialism, as it sees itself engaging in great power conflict, both with Russia and China, and the African continent seems like, is sort of poised to become a real battlefield for this new Cold War. And so for the African continent, for all its linguistic and cultural and ethnic and geographic and diversity, how do, you see, how do you see sort of the role of the continent in the coming period as we continue to see efforts, you know, to bring about world order that isn't controlled from Washington? For our diversity, for the difference among us, one thing that we all need is peace. We need peace to develop. We need peace to move people out of poverty. We don't want to be drawn into any Cold War or any other war. We don't want war. We have had enough. We've been humiliated for over 600 years. We were hunted as slaves, traded as slaves. We were colonized. We moved from classical colonization, neo-colonialism. All these humiliating things. We've had enough of our torture. We have had enough crucifixion. It's time for Africa to also have its resurrection. And that resurrection cannot come under a Cold War. That is why our position is of non-alignment. We have the right to pursue our own interests, while others also have the right to pursue their own interests. But one thing that is in common is that we need a peaceful world. All of our, all our people need a peaceful world. The Americans need to live in peace. The Europeans need to live in peace. The Africans need peace. The Russians need peace. All need peace. Everything that friends peace threatens all of us. It threatens our peaceful existence here, and it also threatens our progress. War is destructive. It destroys wealth. It destroys production, increases poverty, and increases despair. It brings suffering. It brings pain. We don't need this. We have had enough. We want to develop and developing peace, and we don't want to be shackled to wars that are not ours. There are not wars that are ours or benefit us, but we are there to try and offer solutions because every war, no matter how small it is, it has got ripple effects. It affects not only the primary people involved in it, but there are also secondary implications. We don't want war. So I have some thoughts um, I will go back to, but Sabi and Reef, do you have any thoughts? That was a lot, but yeah. I think he makes it very clear about, at least in Zambia, uh, where he stands on this war in Ukraine. Abby. That's right. I was just going to say um, it's it's not surprising to me. And I'm glad that he mentioned that that Russia never colonized uh, in Africa, um, because I don't think a lot of people are aware of that. And that would explain, you know, the fact that Africa said that they wanted to, to remain neutral in reference to this conflict. I felt like that was the right way to go. 
Um, and of course, you know, they have received pressure from other countries, other European countries to not remain neutral and to take the side of Ukraine. But the thing is, is that they remember their history. They remember their experiences that they've had uh, with Russia. And so I don't blame them for just wanting to stay out of it. But I agree. Same thing. Like war is not good for anybody, uh, except for the people who are part of the weapon uh, manufacturer business. Yeah. Like it's good for them. Right. It's profitable for them. Right. Yeah, I mean, I think it it mentioned the the um treatment of like black people in Ukraine. I think in that story, didn't yeah. it? Okay, which no one's talking about. No, no one has talked about. And Garland Nixon, I know, talked about it, and he's off Twitter, so he can right. get let back on there. That would be nice. Um, right. Yeah, we talked about how the African students were treated in Ukraine when this first started um, mm -hmm. and they wouldn't let them get on the trains. We did. We talked about that at RBN. Um, but no, you're right. Uh, a lot of people that have discussed this have left that piece out. And um, I talked about the message that came from the Peace Corps where they were warning mm, yeah. black Americans not to go over there to volunteer to help because this is what you are going to have to deal with if you come over here. And this is how they view black people in Ukraine. And it was really interesting to me that same thing, like what Colin was saying, most people who have covered this conflict have not brought this up about the way that they've been treating uh, black people in Ukraine. Well, I mean, um, uh, not just you, uh, 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 Omali Yeshitela, uh, raided by the FBI because he was supposedly right. uh, colluding with Russians. The, the African, mm -hmm. the leader of the African people's socialist party, like colluding with Russians, they send drones into his house. How old is he? Like, I think I want to say he's in like 60s, 70s, mm -hmm. right? Like, yeah. he's been at it for a while. He told me after an interview that, like, the first thing he thought of was Fred Hampton. Like, and it's like, I didn't need to ask any more than that. I knew exactly what he meant, you know? Like, so, I mean, they shot through walls to get that guy. So anyway, um, you got more, Colin? Well, that's the article, but there are a couple of things I said I wanted to mention. So just going back to it, um, Dr. Mamembe kind of mentions that Russia has never colonized any country that they helped to liberate, you know? Um, the way I kind of looked at that, and especially given where in my work and my visits in East Africa. This in a lot of ways also kind of, I'm not sure if he was even thinking this, but to me, this also kind of reminds me of what China is also doing in Africa, you know? And I know I've kind of mentioned this, you know, online. I know I kind of mentioned this to you, Reef. And I know that there is kind of like a pro-China like um, stance, especially on the left in terms of like, oh, China's going in and helping the Africans with infrastructure and all that. But I want to caution people for having been on the ground and talking to actual, like my friends who are actually seeing what's happening. Many of them are not necessarily are appreciative of what China is doing. Because again, Dr. Mamembe is socialist. So the idea that he's thinking about is, and I would assume he kind of alluded to it in this uh, in his interview, is for Africans to seize the means of production. And my question is, how is China doing that? Are they allowing Africans to liberate using their own materials to help liberate themselves? And the question, and the answer is, depending where you are and depending on your person that you're talking to may be. But from what I see, the answer is probably no, because China's coming in and giving them, you know, like the infrastructure. But for what I understand, especially from people that I've talked to, often, especially with a lot of these infrastructure projects, it's the Chinese who is supervising the Africans there. And often than not, the Africans are being mistreated from what they tell me, you know, and then at the end of the day, does that money go back into those countries that this infrastructure is benefiting to help? Not necessarily. A lot of that money is going back to China. So, so I want people, and 
I haven't really said this a lot because I know for me, a lot of it, the, my experience with this is very anecdotal. So I don't want to necessarily come in and kind of talk about it without researching it a little bit more and having some facts behind, you know, what I'm saying. But that being said, you know, I do think we need to kind of take caution to the wind, especially if you haven't been to Africa before, that the post-China stances that certain people make may not necessarily be necessarily reflective of the Africans who are living and are dealing with the conditions. And not to say it's bad, every country is different. So I can't speak for all of them, but I know for at least in Uganda, where I spent significant amount of time, at least from the people that I talked to there, that is the case in certain situations. So that being said, Savvy, uh, as you as you said, you are going to leave us now. Um, so before you go, is there anything that you want to plug or anything that you want people to be mindful of, you know, before you go? And absolutely thoughts um, on whatever you want, probably. So, so last word for you. Yeah, sure. So uh, we've been talking a lot about the railroad workers uh, tomorrow night. I actually do have one uh, railroad worker confirmed that's coming on. There may be another as well. Um, so I'm going to get to hear from them uh, about how all this went down and, and what they really want. And hopefully we can try to motivate them in some way, shape or form to to push back. Maybe if, if it's a wildcat strike or whatever they can do. And uh, we'll, we'll find out tomorrow, like if they're set up to do a strike, if they need to. Um, if they can like legally and, and, and all those sorts of things, but I'll finally get a chance to talk to them tomorrow. So that's what I have coming up. Okay. Cool. And I think most of us know where you are, but just in case you don't, your Twitter and your YouTube channel is listed in the subscription. So those of you who are here and new, uh, please sub to Savvy, please, you know, follow her on Twitter and Thank you so much for joining us, even though it was short, but it just means we'll have to help you on again for a little, hopefully longer period next time. Yep. So. All righty. Appreciate, appreciate you, you. Sammy. Thank you. Send Thanks, those guys. workers over here when you're done. Love you. <laughs> we'll do so. Bye. Bye. Bye.